Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Crossing Borders. I'm Mike Ginn. That's Extremo Alex Soto. I know we've been gone for a couple weeks, but we're back continuing our march towards Luke's Fight League 22 on May 26th. Uh, this week, we're going to be previewing a couple more fighters, both of them involved in title contests this uh, upcoming uh, show. We're going to be talking about Soraya Roscoe Rodriguez. She's going to be fighting for the vacant strawweight title. Uh, and then we're going to be turning our attentions to a late replacement. It was originally supposed to be Roger Garcia. Uh, fighting uh, Draco Casillo. Instead, it's going to be uh, Edward. Uh, I'm sorry, Edgar uh, Delgado. He's stepping in. Uh, so we'll see what uh, Alex thinks about those uh, changes and everything. Of course, we'll talk about his uh, his uh, death race across the desert in uh, California. We'll talk about that a little bit as well. But first, make sure you check out FightersFirst.shop. Get all the latest and greatest apparel. Support the show. Support the brand. Uh, let our apparel be a part of your journey. Uh, and then speaking of that, uh, coming up later this week, we're going to be launching the Justin uh, Moose Muslia uh, collection. So MMA nice. fighters pay attention. He's an up and coming fighter out of Tiger Shulman's. Uh, he was about to make his pro debut about a year and a half ago. Uh, life got kind of in the way. He put MMA on the side. Now he's back with a fury and a passion. He had a lot of injuries at the time, kind of weighed on him. We did that interview with Unfiltered. So check that out. Um, but afterwards, we got talking. And we're going to be a part of his journey. We'll be a part of his story. So check out Justin Muslia. His collection is going to be coming soon. Alex, that kid has a huge following, too. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he was a kickboxer, MMA, amateur MMA guy coming up in the New Jersey, New York area. And he, okay, was, set, yeah. he was set to make his debut on Cage Fury Fighting Championships. His opponent got sick, and then he broke his jaw, and then it was just one thing after another. Shit, man. How do you break so, his – during practice? Yeah, and sparring, of all things. Yeah, right before the fight, he broke – he broke his – fractured his jaw. He, um, he ate a knee in practice. I don't know if it was a knee or a right hand or what the case was, but like right in like here, it's like a little fracture, and they sidelined him, and at that point, he was just like, you know how it is. When you're a regional fighter, you have a real job. You have other yeah. commitments to try to keep paying those bills. You got a family to support, so on and so forth, Yeah, and you got to work, you know? <laughs> you got to work. I mean, even now, here you are, you know, retired professional fighter. I can actually finally say retired now. A retired <laughs> professional fighter, you do the yeah. Luke's Fight League commentary, but what are you doing when you're not? Yeah, you're I'm working, working your man. real job, hustling, man. There's the hustle is real, man. It never yeah. stops. So, you know, people got careers and other things, and you know, he decided to focus on that for a minute. And then, uh, I'm not gonna spoil the whole interview, you can guys can check it out on the network. But long story short, he had the opportunity to step back in the gym just to say hello. Next thing you know, he's he's training him, he's like sparring with the uh, the executioner Leo. Uh, nice. and he's like, man, I miss this. I love this. Yeah. And here he is back, back a hundred percent full steam and aiming for his pro debut later this summer. So it's going to be exciting stuff. I'm glad we can get in there, um, and support him as much as we can. And we're looking forward to his, his future as well in the sport. You know, when I'm talking about fighters like that, I, I always think about like how courageous it is for these guys to, to, to turn it into a career. Like, it's just so crazy. You got everything up against you. You got, you know, you know, people that are saying, why, why are you doing this? Don't understand why you have this vision and to have to go against all those odds and then be able to fight professionally. And I mean, it's just I mean, it's not just simple. It's like, yeah, I'm just going to go pro. I mean, it's it's such a commitment it's such a mindset. It's such a <clears throat> uh, like a drastic. I mean, something clicks in your brain, man. I think that those that fight have that kind of mentality. It's just um, it's pretty cool, man, and admirable to see to. To, to know of a story like him, you know, so I'm looking up Justin. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll be cheering him yeah, on. He'll, he'll be everywhere on the, on the, uh, on the shop coming soon. So check him Excellent. out. Um, but yeah, it's a commitment. You know, we talked about that during his interview, like these regional fighters that no matter how great they are, you know, you're making that commitment to go pro and yeah, it's great. You'll have money coming in you'll have this coming in. But the truth is, you can barely make ends meet when you first fight your first few pro fights. Like not yeah. everybody's an Aaron Pico that does it in front of the world and Bellator, right? Like right. some people or AJ McKee Jr. or something like that. A lot of these guys and girls, you're fighting several fights before you ever even get a look at a major promotion. And then you hope after a few fights in that major promotion, maybe you can finally step aside and do this full time. Yeah. But otherwise, after you pay your, your coaches and your training partners and you pay your camps and you pay your agents and your managers. And, you know, if you don't get that 50K, right, <laughs> you don't get that bonus, 
you, you might have a couple thousand dollars left after spending, you know, three three months training for a fight, yeah, two exactly. months training for a fight. So, you know, you got to keep grinding away, doing that real job. And until this becomes your real job and you if you're one of the fortunate few that can do this full time. Yeah. And that, uh, that's why it's like, man, it's admirable when guys do that. You're in a right now. He is in a position where nobody right now has any type of, you know, like interest in his career you know right now he's got to prove everybody wrong that he's in that process and um and, you know and he's he's gonna do that he, you know he's if he really wants it if he really is gonna chase it he's gonna get it you know so yeah uh, and he's got a bright future i mean he's a, he has a relatively like big following for a guy who's yet to make his pro debut yeah um and even has a funny story about being part of a boy band when he was younger so there you go right. <laughs> so there's always Good. an interesting tale uh, so check that out. It's on the network. Uh, but today, Alex, we're talking about Luke's Fight League 22. We're continuing our march towards uh, May 26. They gave us plenty of time because the show was kind of pushed off. Uh, and speaking of which, real quick, uh, me and Alex decided that the show's crossing borders will start coming out on Mondays now. So that's good for all of us. It's good for our schedules. But also, I was thinking about after we decided that it's good for your travel schedule. Because <laughs> yeah. like because like Thursday, Friday, stuff like that. We're trying to like maneuver around you scheduling like flying in and out of Mexico and stuff like that. So we won't catch Alex in the airport anymore, which is sad, but <laughs> at least we'll have a little better connection, I hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it'll be it'll be best all the way around. Uh but we talked about this a little bit. Uh Soraya Roscoe Rodriguez, she's fighting for the vacant strawway title. You know, her opponent, uh Tanya Torres, was uh, you know, decided she didn't want to fight anymore for Luke. So she stepped aside. Uh, she's going to be stepping up against uh, Dianita Reyes, uh, Diana Reyes, uh, for the vacant strawweight title. Uh, the killer queen, uh, Soraya uh, Roscoe, has quite a bit of following, speaking of her. But before yeah. we talk about her, she has a saying on her Instagram page, fight like a Mexican. Like, that's her hashtag. I want to know what that means to you. What does fight like a Mexican mean to you? <clears throat> you know, it's funny because I get that all the time from uh, Francisco, you know, because I, I always put like hashtag fight like a Mexican. Um, and Francisco, he's always, asking, he's always asking me the same thing. He's like, Alex, what does it mean? What does it mean? And it's, I'm always like, it means like all the other Mexican boxing heroes we've had, Julio Cesar Chavez, you know, and, and Oscar de la Hoya, and I even time out. Time out. Time Mexican, out. but he's Mexican. All right. Time out. Who did you put first? Huh? Julio Cesar Chavez. Yeah, you put popularity, him first, right? Popularity. Because of pure popularity. That's why I went that way. That's go back the only a few, reason. Go back a few episodes, people. You'll know why I just paused him on that one. But go ahead. <laughs> please, please continue. <laughs> and then, so anyways, um, so, you know, fighting like a Mexican, you're, 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 um, you get a you, though. You, you fight in there. You get inside the pocket. You stay in the pocket and you stand and bang. You know, that's, that's a fighting like a Mexican. Um, and you Just know, hard, we're, hard -headed. we're hard headed. We, we, you know, we stay in the pocket and we throw down and, 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 and we're all about exciting fights, you know? So that's, that's fight like a Mexican. You're not going to see a Mexican guy shoot for a single leg, could take the guy down and lay him pray. You're, you're not going to get that from a Mexican fighter. So what you're saying in short is that when Orozco goes for this title, she's going to be putting on a show. Yeah, exactly. And I, you know, every every fight you've seen her, you know, fight, uh, look her up, look up on YouTube, you know, look at some of the some of the stuff that we've seen on her. I mean, she's fought a lot of her losses, dude, were all like for are now UFC fighters, you know, all these female losses. Uh, but she's had uh quite an excited matchup, man. Like uh when she fought uh Sil uh Silvana Gomez in um Combat Americas. It was a really exciting matchup, and, and she actually did a pretty good job, you know, kind of busting up Silvana. Uh, and she's Silvana's now doing fantastic in the UFC. She's in there now, uh, having some good uh, barn barn fights of her own in the UFC. Um, you know, she she lost a close decision, in my opinion, in that fight. So she's always putting in the work, man. Always putting in a lot of work. So um, I really like how how she performs and how she comes in. And that fight against Tani Torres. That was a very, very tight, tight, tight split decision, man. You know, it could have gone either way in that title matchup. And um, so every time she performed, Which she is fights why they were going to run it back. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, uh, and and maybe perhaps that's why Tina Torres uh, didn't want to take on that fight, you know. So 
See, um, we keep saying stuff like that, and that's why she keeps sending me like side eye faces. <laughs> Who knows, Tor- man? Torres they- is never gonna be a fan of this show now because we keep saying <laughs> stuff like that. And she sends me like the emojis that are like. No, I mean, listen. When you're a fighter, <laughs> you will fight anybody, anytime, anyplace, anywhere. Okay, and I'm sure Tony Torres would fight no problem. Will put on anybody in front of her, especially how she is right now, undefeated, smashing everybody. Uh, putting in some beautiful performance. I mean, Tiny Torres is an incredible fighter. I, I'm, I'm going to miss that she's not going to be fighting in Luke's Fight League. And wherever she goes next, she's going to have a fantastic career. Well, I mean, never say never. Don't get me you wrong. Know, you know how the, you know how the fight game is. Never say never. Like, she could be back but when you're, Yeah, exactly. When you're when you're fighting, you are fighting anybody they put in front of you, right? So these these decisions of who you're going to fight not does not rest on the fighter, okay? That's not the fighter's job the fighter's job is to fight anybody anytime any place anywhere the manager's job is to make sure that they get the right fight at the right time and the right fight at the right time right now for Saray Oroz- against Saray Orozco is just not it it makes sense I get the team I get what they're doing and I understand it um but when I say that I'm not saying that Tony Torres is avoiding this fight by any means necessary she she will fight anybody and she's not scared of of any any straw weight out there right now. She will, yeah, it's, she, pro- it's promotion it. versus manager, right? Like the promotion wants the best fight for the fans, best fight for itself and promotion. And the fighter and the management has to look out for them. Yeah, especially in an up-and-coming fight league like Luke's Fight League, you're you're there to really try to get to the next level. Like Luke's exactly. Fight League is great, but you're there to try to get to the UFC, Bellator, whatever the case is. Like you're using it as a stepping stone. And, and Luke's Fight League knows that as big as it's getting. I mean, this fight league is growing like crazy. I mean, obviously, the numbers on UFC Fight Pass and ESPN Deportes and Fox Sports, like, it's not lying. Like, it's growing, and it's drawing big. And a lot of these fighters that, you know, like we talked about, Draco Casillo and all those guys, they're becoming household names now. Yeah. And they're getting those, like, feelers out from the UFC and stuff like that because of Luke's Fight League. So I think she made a mistake stepping away from a major platform on UFC Fight Pass. But like you said, she has to do what's best for her. But let's talk about Soraya a little bit. You know, you talk yeah. about some of her, her losses, like uh, Gomez. Go back even further, Rui. Like, that was her second fight ever. She's in the UFC right now. Yeah. Uh, she's one and one I think, in the UFC or something like that right now. Uh, I call her the headlock queen because she, like, the way she did Cheyenne Bays that first fight, and she just kept her in the headlock the whole fight. Um, but, you know, you're fighting all these tough fights, and you're going on and on. And she's been in the – like you said, fight like a Mexican. She's been in that pocket fighting some of the toughest fighters yeah. now throughout her entire career, which I believe she's now six and five going for the strawweight title. Uh, what can you say about Orozco that makes her different from other fighters? Like what, what's, what makes her stand out? I think her boxing uh, is sticks out more than the rest. I think she likes to stand, like I said, she, you know, in, in her title uh, fight like a Mexican, she likes to stand and bang. And I think, She's also very smart on it. So she uses her length. She uses her distance uh, to, to really measure her opponents. I think the one disadvantage that Sarai Orozco might bring into this is her aggressiveness. And she needs to bring up that aggressiveness uh, up a little bit. Um, she tends to be a little hesitant when, she, uh, she, when she's throwing down and she's fighting and getting into a fight where she's letting, well, she puts in a lot of work throughout the first and second round. And going into that third round, you know, she's done all this work. And if she just turns up the pressure just a little bit more, she could really, she could really nail her, uh, uh, her opponents and really finish them off. But I think it's, it's that process and that learning really of getting that confidence to really turn up the pressure in her fights that might really, really, uh, um, I think that's the piece that's missing. I think that's why she hasn't really been able to break through some of these top fights that she's had with these top level uh, females. Um, so I, 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 that's the one thing that I'm, that I'm hoping to see in this fight. This is, just an, this is a great fight that she's got going up against, and it'll be a great opportunity for her to really step up that aggressiveness. I think it's a perfect matchup for her, too, because you got another girl that likes to go out there and bang. Uh, Reyes has got some ground and pound finishes. Uh, she did take the L against Silvana Gomez, uh, like their one like mutual opponent. Uh, she just got, uh, stopped by her in her last fight. She had a cancel fight before this, before now. So she's been out of action. I want to say since late 2020. So now almost a year and a half later, she's been kind of dormant. So hopefully there's not any kind of ring rust and she can come out and do what she wants to do. 
But uh, Diana Reyes is one of those those fighters that likes to come, put on an exciting show for the fans, go for it. So this might be right up a Roscoe's alley, like somebody that's going to stand there, you know, quote unquote, fight like a Mexican, right. and uh, really put it in there and put it on a great show for the fans. Uh, do you think that the experience advantage is going to pay off for a Roscoe in this fight? I think so. I think that she's going to shine in this fight. I think in this fight, she's um, she's kind of uh, in, a, in a in a very unique opportunity to to really demonstrate. I think she's you know having on that really close decision loss to Tiny Torres. I think. She's going to step it up in this fight. I think she'll be able to um, to really I, – I think she might even get the finish against Diana. So, and that's um, not to say experience isn't a factor on both sides because Re- Reyes is 35 as well. Like Reyes has been fighting for a while too. They're both 6 and 5. Um, I just think the level of competition is what I meant by experience-wise for Orozco. Yeah. I mean, you look at you look at her, her, her fights. You know, a lot of them have – her losses have gone to decision. There's been like a submission of on flu choke, I think, that she got earlier in her career, um, which is a rookie mistake, you know, holding on to that head when when somebody's taking you, when you're trying to take that person down, you know, somebody holds on your head, then you're stuck. Or you're holding on to the head and you get stuck in a von flu choke. It's like yeah. the first thing I like to, to You get flipped you over and the next thing you know, you're done. Yeah, it's like, oh my gosh, you, you, you know, you could have, this fight could have finished, you know, three rounds ago, but, you know, here we are still in the battle. The person's still making that same mistake over and over, over holding on to that head on that takedown off oh, on flu choke all day, you know? So, um, but that it's was just, a, it's actually a great move. You don't see enough of. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's interesting. Cause I've seen it in Luke's fight league about probably three, four times. Um, and, uh, I, but I see it almost in every fight, that opportunity, that, 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 and, that and the oh, Darce choke right there, that and the Darce choke are the two, like, when you see them, you're like, everybody just kind of, like, pops. So, like, oh, my God, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. You'll see some everybody's used, everybody's used to a guillotine. That's like, yeah, we see that all the time. Or a rear naked choke. But you see, like, a Von Fluke or, or Darce choke, you're like, that, that, that's MMA right there. Yeah, that's the difference right there, man. I love it. I love it. So, do you think she's going to take the uh, vacant flyweight title? What do you think is going to happen in that match? Uh, if I would put my money on this, I, I, I would put it on Sarai Orozco. I'm and, sorry, and, strawweight and, title. I said flyweight. On the strawweight. Yes, yeah, so at 115 pounds, I think Sarai Orozco is going gonna, is gonna to win this fight dominantly. I think she's going to shine in this fight. And I think she also has something to prove, man. You know, So, um, I think a lot of momentum's going her way into this fight. And shout out to her, by the way. I don't usually promote other clothing brands, and I don't know who makes her shirt. Uh-huh. But she has a shirt for sale that I saw on her Instagram. That's pretty killer. You know, it's a oh, killer yeah? queen shirt. It says killer queen across, has her face. It has, has a pretty dope shirt. So, you know, go buy her shirt. Go go support her out. So, uh, she, so I got I got Justin and Sarai right here. <laughs> uh, we don't we don't have anything to do with Sarai's, but yeah, check check out her shirt. It's pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I will. I'm, you know, I'm fair. I'm fair, Alex. I'm not just a you know businessman. I'm fair. Hey, we're supporting. We're supporting the fighting. Okay? Especially up and coming fighters. Especially, you know, they need everything we can. Um, you know, she's 30 years old. She's she's knocking on that door of like this is probably, you know, she needs to make that run now to try to get like some something on the next level. So though there are a lot of great like up and coming fighters, or not up and coming fighters, established fighters that are in their 30s in the women's like divisions. You look right. at Cyborg, you just saw her and Arlene Blenkow throw down in their late 30s, and one of the best yeah. fights of the year. Uh, you look at Kayla, she's like around 30 something. Uh, Amanda, like all the best in the world are in that Holly Holm. Holly Holm's like 40. Yeah, you still pay to see her, right? Yeah, uh, they're talking about her maybe crossing over and fight Katie Taylor again. So, here we go. Okay, yeah, I mean, yeah, so there's women, a lot of movement in the female division. I feel like the last three like years later in their life, like women tend to fight longer than men nowadays. Yeah, and, and I feel like the, the the there's been like a female renaissance in the last three to four years since 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 post um uh what's her name rousey yeah ronda rousey sorry <laughs> since wow since ronda rousey left this is why she ain't coming back to mma people are like what's her name what's her name who, again who? what's her name who? i'm By terrible way, ronda just won the smackdown women's title last night hey listen i i have i've always thought that she's just been an incredible athlete i think well, who was it that said that she was a joke now or whatever Oh, uh, uh, that was uh, Juliana Pena. Yeah, Juliana Pena, who's now the 135 pound champion. But that's because she wants that. that payday. She wants yeah. to come back and fight. How cool would that it's be? like I'd it's love like to every, see that fight. Yeah, it's like everybody last night that or at Saturday night after they won their fights, they were calling out Conor McGregor. Conor's not the number one contender, but they know. That it's those the Fedia right there, dude. It's all about that Fedia right there. Yeah, even Charles Oliveira is like the champ, or was the champ, or vacant, whatever. 
But like even he called out Conor McGregor. It's like he did. They, that's why they know that's where the money is. Yeah. And just like Pena, she knows Ronda Rousey. If she came back for one fight or a few fights or whatever, back up the truck. People are going to watch. Michael Chandler, though, dude, that that guy. I he cuts I feel a hell of a being, promo, doesn't he? He did that promo after that <laughs> fight, that crazy knockout of, of Tony Ferguson, and now that was a hell of a fight. That was crazy. Ooh. Ferguson was taking him to him the first round, second round. Chandler hit that kick. It was you're gonna see that highlight on every fight, like highlight reel from now until the end of time. Yeah, dude, man, it reminds Chandler. me of the Anderson Silva one on Vitor. Uh, it was better than that. It was way better than that because uh, you know we were expecting Anderson Silva to do something like that, something flashy and crazy. Michael Chandler to do that against Tony Ferguson that blew my mind. I was just not expecting that. You know, I was not seeing that. Maybe a overhand right that connected right. You know. But man, to do that, oh, that's just so cool, man. That was that the was crazy so thing cool. is Tony is the one that like was landing the the left hooks and stuff like that in the first round. Right. Yeah. That's why I love this sport, man. You never know. Never know. But speaking of loving this sport, something you never know. Let's transition over to the other fighter we're talking about today, uh, ah, okay, Edgar, yeah. Edgar Delgado. Um, I still haven't heard what happened to Roger Garcia. I think I haven't injured. heard either. I in think fact, he's I injured. Think because they said, like, we'll welcome you back as soon as you're good to go or whatever the case is. So I believe he's either injured or sick or something like that. But well, hopefully we'll get more information, especially fight week. Maybe Alice can, can call some of his contacts and find out what happened to, to Roger Garcia. Because Luke's Fight League really hasn't said much as far as promotionally for that. They just said Edgar Delgado's in, and he's fighting the champ, going for the lightweight title. Uh, tell us what you know about uh, Edgar Delgado. Well... I mean, so far, well, the guy's from Costa Rica, and when he By comes the way, out, second show in a row, we've, we've talked about a Costa Rican fighter. Yeah, uh, we it's really cool, man. We, we, so. Luke's Fight League has really attached itself to, you know, Costa Rica and those guys out there. Venezuela, too, a lot of from uh, Venezuela. Valenzuela? Venezuela. Valen <laughs> going out there, and uh, they, they, I mean, there's like a really cool connection Venezuela. with that, man. And we also, you know, Brazil, too, of course. Um, you know, they, they've really... Uh, have a really good pipeline of communications and talent pool that's coming out of those countries. Uh, but yeah, Costa Rica is always bringing some bangers, man. And, um, you know, it, I've come to uh, really know a little bit more about the Costa Rican fighters that are showing up because they're just making waves, man. It, it's, it's, uh, it's really fun to see those guys fight. Uh, when it comes to Delgado, El Cebollero, um, do you know what that means? El Cebollero? No, I don't. I was going to actually ask you. I was going to say like the onion, like the cebolla is, is onion. So the cebollero, like the onion cutter. Oh, okay. Like make you yeah. cry? I guess so. Maybe. I'll have to look into that a little bit more. I'm sure. I was going to ask you. I was like trying to translate that to myself. And I was like, I, what? But uh, no, man. So, okay. So they needed somebody. Okay. So Garcia got out. Cebollero got in. And um, they're basically trying to get somebody in to fight against Draco Cosillo. Because Draco Cosillo is just a beast of an athlete, a beast of a fighter, uh, very, very, very high talented with tons of experience. So they needed to get somebody who has equal amount of experience, equal amount of aggression. Uh, and there's this kid right here, man, likes to stand and bang. He took on Alejandro Pata Martinez. Um, and I remember this fight in particular because it was such a close fight with, you know, with the, with the veteran Alejandro Pata Martinez, you know, just going back and forth against Delgado. It was a split decision loss. And uh, but it was one hell of a performance on his end, standing and banging right in front, man. It was so much fun, and that's the fight that I actually got to call with uh, um, with uh, with Gamebred, man. I got to call that fight with Gamebred, dude. That was so sick. One of the your neighbors here in Florida. Yeah. And uh, so, if you're looking at that fight, take a look. Look at some of the stuff. He, I noticed that he went for the takedown against Pato. Try to and take. It was a split down. decision loss. It wasn't like a big like. It was a split decision loss. That fight could have gone either way. It really could, and I, and I remember Gamebird was saying, "Oh, it could, it could be other way," but I got Pato, and I, I was saying the same thing as I, I got Pato too. Um, but it could go either way. Did you say really Francisco tight. was saying Delgado one or something like that? Because one of you saying Delgado. Yeah, maybe Delgado, but it was tight, man. It was really tight. But that that being said, though, you know he is coming off that loss and then stepping on to fight for the title against Draco Cosillo. That man has got nothing to lose as he's stepping up into this fight. You know. Yeah, and he bounced back with a win. He went over to INF and got a win. Oh, okay. He did. All right. Okay. Yeah, he went over and beat Roa um, in March, March uh, 12th. He uh, got the ground and pound win there. So he bounced back with a win. He's coming off a win. 
Yeah, fantastic. We haven't seen uh, Draco since September. Uh, yeah. So, you know, there's going to be uh, fireworks in this fight. We know that. You know, Draco Castillo comes on to put a show. He comes out to, like, make sure people know he's in the stage. He's going to probably rock that green hair. You know, he's going to come out, try to be the center of attention. Yeah. And Delgado's going to slide in under the radar and put on a show. This is going to be a battle for Casillo. He's not going to be in there. You know, this is not going to be a first-round knockout. This is not going to be any of these, like, quick fights. This is going to be a war for him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you never know when it's a wall, a war, it's going to be a war for both of them, man. It's going to, yeah. cause it, one of the things that Delgado does is he does keep his hands down really low. He comes out very aggressive, but he keeps those hands down low throughout the fights. That could be problematic for him, but he, but he's never been very, stopped. Yeah. But he's very aggressive, very aggressive in the beginning. Whereas Draco Cosillo, especially after all this time off, he is known for coming in cold. You know, he, he comes in, it takes a little while for him to warm up, and then he's and then he's just a, a second a, a round. Zombie. He's ready to go. Yeah, he's a zombie afterwards, man. But Delgado comes out aggressive, stays aggressive throughout the entire fight, man. And there's no quitting that guy, man. He is just a fuck. He's tough as they come, man. And you're talking about a guy like he's never been stopped. Yeah. All his losses are decision. The last two have been split decision losses. Yeah. Um, so he's coming. He's a legitimate contender. Like we didn't talk about him. We didn't know he was coming. Everybody was planning for Roger Garcia, which including Casillo, right? Casillo has been doing his whole camp planning for Roger Garcia until the last couple of weeks. So this is going to be a change up for the champ. The champ obviously had to approve the change. I'm sure they didn't just surprise him. They're like, are you okay with this? And yeah, he he's got a, like, that, that split decision loss <clears throat> uh, was against one of them was against Miguel Villegas, who's one of the one of the one of the top like guys coming up. I mean, this is a guy who's got a high level jujitsu game, um, really good stand up game. Very tough, coming out of great camp uh, down in Entram. And he's now, I think he's traveled and he's gone up north somewhere to go train. I, I'm not exactly with who he is now. I want to say CSA maybe. Uh, don't quote me on that. But regardless, he's been, he's just been putting in the game, man. He's been putting in a lot of work. And uh, coming, coming in with a split decision loss against uh, Villegas just tells you that he's, he's a hard guy to put away. What's that? Villegas. Yeah. Villegas fought his last couple fights in uh, Combate. Okay. So he's been moving around. But go ahead. Yeah, no, he has. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure he has. And he's been, like I said, I'm been, been crushing it. But eight and three. I mean, the dude's a beast. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's been he's been putting in the work, like I said. Um, yeah, he's got like I said, he puts it in, he puts in a lot of work. He's a tough guy to put away. And I think he's a it's a perfect matchup for Draco Gosio. I think it's gonna be very dangerous for Draco. If he comes in a little bit slow, like he normally does in the opening seconds of the of the first round, uh, but after that, man, it's 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 going to be game on. Dracos Cosio is going to have to use all his tools in his tool bag to see if he can put this guy away. Yeah, this is one of those fights on paper. You look at you look at Draco's resume. You know the dude is one of the top guys in the world. But Delgado's been busy. This will be his sixth fight in the last like year and a half, two years. Since he's joined Luke's in 2021, he's been fighting nonstop. He's fought a couple outside of the promotion. This will be his fourth, I think, fight in the promotion. Um, yeah. And he stays busy. Like this dude, like since, since March of 2021, this fight coming up next uh, in a couple weeks will be his sixth fight. That's a lot in That's a little busy. over a year. That's like fighting every like three months, two months, three months. And they've uh, all so been decisions, right? Uh, oh, the ground and pound. The last one was a ground and pound. His last, well, <laughs> all the Luke's fight leagues ones have been decisions, except for um, he knocked out uh, Luis Enrique Espinosa in the first round. Yeah, all the Luke's fight leagues have been decisions. The two that he went outside in. Uh, sorry, I got all of my information over here. I'm trying to keep yeah. my camera from glitching. Uh, but yeah, the two he stepped outside of the promotion, he got stoppages. Okay. All the four, the four inside, the three inside the promotion have all been decisions. Yeah, yeah. But has got nothing pretty. to lose, man. He's got nothing to lose in this fight, man. I, I, I you know, he's coming yeah, in. He's gonna, with coming no out worries. He wants. And, and Draco Garcia's got to defend his plate, man. He's got to defend his spot in the sport. And you know, there's been a lot. He's been on the cusp of getting into the UFC. You know, talking to uh, some of his coaches and talking to people close to him. Um, you know, that everybody's been talking about him getting the UFC soon, uh, you know, stepping in. 
And all of a sudden, like, you know, pan the pandemic hit. So he's been kind of on this, like, in no man's land, you know, about to, you know, he's he's proven himself, you know, against Hugo Flores. You know, he, he fought him twice, you know. Um, and he's proven himself since against El Loco and uh, I forget the other. Oh, yeah, El Tiburón. And and Dominguez. Dominguez. And, yeah. So yeah, so he's been like at the cusp, just kind of idling, ready to get that that phone call from the UFC. But it's been two years, man. It's been over two years, um, you know. And it can be very frustrating when you are, um, you know, when when you're waiting for that UFC to call. You got twenty some over twenty something fights. Uh, you've been in the game for a long time. When are you gonna get that call? You know. And uh, it, unfortunately, it just hasn't been his 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 moment yet. And it could be in he so he could be in a position where like I'm so close, I've been here for so long, you know, a loss could derail that a few fights, you know. And when I say few fights, we're talking months of preparation for each fight, you know, three fights, three fights of of of, of good place fights where he's uh, throwing it out and 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 winning in 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 fashion. So you know that that's another thing that's going up against Draco Cosio in this fight. Yeah, I mean Cosio's won five in a row, you, you know this. He needs something like, let's be real. If he wants to get at fly, I've been mean, sorry, at lightweight, 155 pounds, you want to get the UFC's attention. You, you need something dramatic. You need a highlight reel. Like he needs to go out and knock Delgado out. And that's not the right opponent for him. Like, cause Delgado has been going through wars. Delgado goes to decisions. He doesn't lose. He's never been stopped. And that's not right. saying it can't happen until it does happen. Right. Like we've seen fighters yeah. before, like, Oh, this guy's never been stopped. And then he gets knocked out. Right. It happens, yeah. but Delgado's a very, very tough fighter, and he's going to bring it to you know. This is a bad matchup, in my opinion, for Casillo. Like Roger Garcia, nothing against Roger Garcia because he's a terrific fighter as well. But Roger Garcia, you could see you know Casillo getting that highlight. This is going to go down as probably one of those. Um, who was it? It was Pena and uh, who Pena fight a couple fights ago that was just like a bloodbath. Uh, uh Daniel, no, oh no, um. George, um, ah, who did Pedro Pena fight a couple fights ago? The, that was Costanzo. But anyway, it was like a bloodbath, and it was like one of those highlight film, like oh, wow. you saw yeah. all three rounds, and you were just like, oh, my God, this has to be one of those fights for Casillo to come out on top of to get the highlights and to get into that next level of UFC. And like I said, I just don't think it's a good matchup for him because yeah. Delgado has nothing to lose. You said it. Delgado can come in do whatever he wants to do. If Delgado comes out and falls flat and loses, he was a late replacement. Right. He wasn't planning on this. This is a six fight he's had like in a year and a half. Right. This guy is like, he's tired. You know, he's, he has all the reasons not to win this fight. But if he comes out and wins this fight, that crushes, like you said, that crushes Casillo. Casillo now has to go back and win three or four more fights. And that's another two years right there exactly. of his life trying to get back to the next level. Exactly. Um, so that's that's the cusp right now of where Cosio is, and he's been inactive on top of that. You know, yeah. in September, you know, we talked been, about him our first show. Yeah, I mean, since September, he has we haven't seen him fight. So this is exactly like the kind of you know uh, position that he's in. Uh, you know, to be a champ, uh, to be a fighter uh, at that kind of a level, it takes a lot of um, preparation, mental preparation. So. Uh, here we're, we're making assumptions here, and and, and I, I just I want to believe that Cosio maybe is not thinking that way. Maybe he's just focusing on the fighter, being the true martial art artist that he is. That he's just taking each fight at a time, yeah. and putting all his efforts in. But it's hard to believe that after all these years of these close co conversations about the UFC signing him, being interested in him, you know, we're 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 at that location. This is this is do or die for him. At least opinion. a Dana White contender series or something. Yeah, get 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 himself one of those right there. But this is a big this is a big moment for his career, uh, and I think that um, let's 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 get through this fight uh, for Cosio, and then get get to get that UFC contract. All right, so we're looking forward to it. Both you know Soraya Roscoe and Elgar Delgado are going to put on a hell of a show. They both you know one might be Costa Rican, but they both fight like a Mexican. <laughs> they both are coming in putting on wars. Uh, but Alex, before we get out of here, we got to dispel a few rumors, okay? So last episode, we were supposed to obviously record on Thursdays like we usually used to do. Okay. It was Cinco de Mayo. I want to clearly point out that we were not heavily intoxicated. 
<laughs> that, that Alex was working. <laughs> he had meetings. I wanted to be, but I was working too. Before that, I had to work. Things got crazy. That was oh, my fault. Right. Okay. But then before that, because we've missed now three weeks, we're, we're like hopping back in the saddle. I know. Before right? that, you were off in the desert. What was all that about? It was fantastic, man. I took a, I took a, uh, it was a five day off road trip in Death Valley. You ever heard of Death Valley? Yeah, of course. All right. Death Valley is just amazing, man. It's the most, uh, it's just this it's massive place of just desert, but mountain is like rocky terrain, you know, and you, know, you see some Death Valley for flying overhead, you know, it's, it's just crazy. It's like, uh, what is it? Area 51 for all the jets that they have out there, man. It's, it's, it's nuts, man. It's incredible. I mean, they call it Death Valley for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of dead things out there for sure, man. One of the crazy yeah. things that I saw out there was there was these, uh, uh, what are they called? Uh, donkeys, wild donkeys all over that place. It's nuts. <laughs> really? Donkeys? Yeah. Wild donkeys everywhere. And then if you, if you had done some research on Death Valley, there's these place called the racetracks where there's these yeah. rocks that are laid out. And they have, you could see that they had traveled on the terrain there, like in a zigzag motion. And for the longest time, nobody knew why they were moving or what was making a move. Was it taking thousands of years or hundreds of years to, for the rocks to make like this crease on this, like, like, uh, this dried up lake bed? Those are the tectonic, te tectonic plates. Yeah. It wasn't the tectonic plates, Mike. It wasn't? What was it? That's what it I always was. <laughs> No, okay, so I'm glad you asked. The reason is, <laughs> what happens was that it does occasionally rain out there. And so when it rains and the temperatures drop below zero, obviously it will drop below uh, uh, 30 degrees, it freezes. And it's very high winds in, in the desert. So what happens is those lakes, as they start to melt the and the winds kick in, they actually move the entire ice sheet with those rocks still attached to the ice and it carves out the the trail and it looks it looks amazing when you go out there because it's just all dry you, it's so dry and you can't even conceive like there ever being water there so it's it's uh really cool man so it leaves these cool track lines uh check it out it's on on death valley the racetrack really cool learn something about new every day every day story there time with alex you can't beat it boom <laughs> the more you know can. You know what? On that, on that, that is a perfect way to end the episode. We're going to end it on story time with Alex. Uh, make sure you guys check out Luke's Fight League 22 coming up May 26th. We'll have another episode before then, doing a little bit more of a preview of the whole card next episode. Uh, we'll be look out for us on Mondays from now on. We're going to be popping up on Mondays a little better for both our schedules. Um, yeah, but I think that's it. Make sure you check out fightersfirst.shop. Make sure you check out uh, everything we got going on. Uh, like we mentioned, we got Justin Mus Muslia coming up. And hell, check out uh, Soraya Roscoe's shirt, too. Uh, go check out her uh, Instagram, too. Go support everybody. Hell yeah. Uh, we're all in this fight game together, trying to make it better. Uh, Alex, any final words? That's all I got. Uh, very prolific. Very prolific. <laughs> all right. We'll, we'll leave it on his uh, trailing rock story. All right. For Extremo Alex Soto, I'm Mike Ginn. This is Crossing Borders. We'll see you next time. We're out.